I'll summarize briefly with a few words from what the panelists said um, yesterday. And I think those words were summar summarized actually by Ian Chubb when he was using the cricketing uh, metaphors of the straight bat. But basically, for those of you who don't know anything about cricket, um, that means that we need to uh, place science in an open, open context. We need to be honest, we need to be direct, we need to be consistent. Uh, and I think they were the kind of summaries of what was um, uh, what came out of the discussions yesterday. So um, we'll go to the first person here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Schlinken. I've just been appointed as the chief scientist of Western Australia, and this relates to a, a comment that I made to Ian last night. In uh, using the cricketing analogy, if you're not playing with a straight bat, you're playing with a crooked bat. And what happens when scientists actually behave badly? I uh, have encountered a situation in my very short tenure where scientists have actually provided misinformation, they've been mischievous and actually misled uh, the community. I, I think this is a really dangerous situation because what is happening is that the trust is actually being broken down within government and it is impacting beyond the particular context of this issue and they're saying scientists cannot be trusted and the comment has come back to me, why are we being asked to kneel at the altar of science? I'd be very interested in your comment. Does anybody want to pick that one up? Gordon. Hit them with the bat. I would <laughs> comment that, that uh, cricket analogies aside, I played rugby, but I won't even try that one. Uh, the, I think the point is, and maybe Phil Campbell's gonna talk about this in a moment, there is an organization called the World Conference on Research Integrity, which I participated in last year in Montreal. Uh, within ICSU, we have a committee on the freedom and responsibility of science. And no doubt what you're saying is an issue, but we as the scientific community need to work together to speak out on issues of irresponsibility and find mechanisms. So I, other than we have process, but it's a difficult problem. Thanks very much, Gordon. Um, we'll, we'll just have one response to each question, because I know we've got a number of questions. I'll go to over here, thank you. Um, Ian, uh, Asan Masood from Australia Fortnight. Could, could we maybe pick up the conversation we began yesterday, which was about, I know I can see that smile, uh, ab about your particular dilemma, or the dilemma of the ministry which you represent, which is environment, perhaps one of the most, if not the most highly charged, politically charged ministries and you have to make decisions which perhaps are much more polarized politically where politicians or policymakers on the left and the right do take quite different views. And they sometimes have, let me put it politely, differing understanding of the same body of scientific evidence. Could, if you could tell us a bit about your dilemma. Um, I, I, th I think you're probably referring to the bovine tuberculosis um, uh, example that I, I mentioned yesterday. Um, I think my role is simply to, to point out not so much the specifics of the evidence, because actually there is, uh, there's underlying uncertainty in a lot of the evidence, but that um, there is a problem to be solved and uh, there a solution needs to be found as a result of that. Um, and it's a matter of sort of stepping back from the problem slightly and trying to give a, a wider perspective on the problem. I think politicians and senior officials spend a lot of their time um, firefighting, essentially, dealing with the short-term issues. Uh, they are perfectly capable of standing back from the problem and seeing it in this bigger context. And, and uh, I would say that with respect to things like bovine tuberculosis, in a UK context, and I suppose this can be contextualized in different sorts of ways for different sorts of groups in other countries. In a UK context, the problem is not actually one about should we kill badgers or shouldn't we kill badgers, um, or do we need to control bovine tuberculosis or do we not? It's uh, badgers in particular are an issue, it's a lens through which a particular higher level argument is happening about the future management of the countryside in the UK. Um, is the countryside going to be managed and uh, the future going to be de determined by those who live and work in it and uh, farm it? Or is it going to, to, going to be determined by people who 
are mainly urban dwellers who see it as a bucolic landscape which is a resource for biodiversity. And those are, the, those are the kind of conflicts that exist within the political process. And they emerge through things like, should we kill badgers or shouldn't we kill badgers? But they also emerge in other areas. And we have some controversy there about whether we actually should, uh, should reduce some bird populations, for example. So they keep, it keeps emerging. But it's, it's, it's the role, I think, of the scientific advisor is to try and contextualize this in a much broader context for everybody and to say, well, actually, within that context, um, are the policies that you're pursuing really the right ones for the long-term outcome? Um, yes, Same thanks. Same question I asked in the last panel. I, I'll could repeat, you repeat it? I'll repeat it again. So we're not just in the business of giving advice. We want it to be taken. So. In the experience of the panelists, why don't policymakers and politicians take the advice? Who wants to take that one? Roger. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, very problematic to answer the question, what does it mean to take scientific advice? Um, so if, if I advised you that it uh, poses health risks to have that third glass of wine and to eat a little bit too much, um, and then tonight you go to dinner, and you have that third glass of wine and you eat a little too much, did you take the advice or not? Um, giving advice, science advice, is not the same thing as giving policy advice. If I were to say to you, don't drink that on advice of your doctor, that's very different than saying, here's the risks. It's quite possible that a policymaker will take on the advice and make any of a range of decisions. And once we get in the idea of thinking that taking on science advice compels one path versus another, then we're no longer in the business of science advice. We're in something very different. Uh, Chris does want to come in on this one. Yeah. Apologies for wanting to dive in on this one. Um, in my experience, it's not just a question of whether they take advice. Um, if we just reframe it about whether how they use evidence, um, some politicians have told me that they don't use evidence at all. They're not interested. Some obviously do use evidence and use it well. The ones that really scare me are the ones that use evidence but use it poorly. Um, and I think we need to think about that as science advisors too. Would you like to take the next one? Yeah, sorry, and uh, Jason Blackstock, UCL, and I'm also going to direct this at two people because of what they raised yesterday. So, Roger, you talked about the structural issues of science advice, and there's some really good examples that we can't get back into. But I want to tie it to Chris's question about the importance of science advice in legislative environments where the political, uh, th where the topic of this panel, the political uh, tensions are at the highest. And what can we learn from things like OTA and what happened there and the structure of post in terms of thinking about that structure? And just connecting a little bit, I noticed Jackie McGlade is actually science advisor to both the executive and the assembly in the UN context. And are there things that we should be thinking about in that context of dual roles? Somebody want to take that? Roger? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things we should take from this meeting is that the provision of science advice is highly contextual. It really depends on your environment. Um, the reference to OTA, the Office of Technology Assessment, which is like a story that that's g lives on, is uh, a, an agency that the U.S. Congress had that was terminated in 1994. Um, it's remarkable that post, uh, th what we heard about yesterday, is, is somewhat of a very unique beast. Um, and the, the need for providing advice to a parliament is very different than the need to provide an advice to a principal, whether it's a minister or a prime minister. So I think, yes, it's very important to contextualize these questions. There's no one size fits all, um, and obviously the needs of a legislature will be far more diverse and maybe smaller granular scale than what you'll get. Um, but that's why we have to open up this discussion to that richness of different advisory mechanisms. Yes, thank you. Um, Agri Business Council of Australia, given that all of our debate is around the level of understanding of science in the community, including government, including politicians, I just wanted to ask Ian, uh, Apologise for that. <laughs> uh, ask Ian, given his previous role as Vice Chancellor of ANU and your current role, do you think that the mechanisms currently available for communication between the science community and the education department, particularly in the government, are adequate, or what would you do to enhance the influence on policy in relation to education of the role of science? Uh, 
no. They um, they aren't adequate, uh, and I guess that the real issue for us uh, is to ensure that the uh, education system is influenced by the future needs for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and it comes back to a communication issue. How do you get um, a good conversation going, good advice being submitted to people who see their primary role as being much more global um, much less focused, let's put it that way. So I don't think there's hostility or anything. I think it's just a question of prioritising. And we have to get priorities changed. And it's the same in that sector as it is with nearly any other sector that we have to deal with. Uh, I, I don't feel hostility. I don't feel negativism. But I feel that sometimes it's too far down the priority list and we just have to work hard and communicate well to get it lifted. Next question. Yeah, thank you from the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment. Uh, we did not talk about the influence of the media. I think it, it's very important to see that uh, the role of a, of a scientific advisor is also altered you know, by the public perception. So within an ambiguous situation, what do you think? And we didn't talk about this. You know, Should a scientific advisor take his own role, his own voice to explain or to defend his position? I can just give uh, a simple example in the case of crisis, uh, which of course Andreas remembers very well. Um, at the time the Commission, when we had uh, identified uh, in EFSA along with the member states that uh, this uh, fenugreek seed came from um, Egypt, um, there was no willingness to, to take measures because simply one could not identify the bacteria in those seeds. And of course, we didn't have the methodology to do it, but the epidemiological evidence was overwhelming and people were dying. So we just went public. And of course, uh, six hours later, measures were taken. Kira Mattis, London School of Economics, soon to be UCL steep. And my question is for Roger. And it, you know, we, we hear the honest broker being uh, bandied about a lot at this meeting. And my question is, given these discussions we've had and, and some of the challenges we've heard, how about we need to kind of refine or add to that concept to make science advice really useful in these, especially in these really contentious uh, policy problems. Yes, uh, first let me say, uh, Kira has a great blog up on the, the website for the conference, and I encourage everybody to read it. Um, the, the notion of the honest broker is, is one of a family of four different roles scientists can play. And for me, I think the, the important thing is not to settle on which one's the best or which one's appropriate, but to have the discussion. Um, what role do we, where we could be post, it could be science advisor, it could be science advisor to a president, um, but ask the question, what role are we playing in this process? How do we define success? Um, opening up that discussion will lead to some very interesting places. Um, so I would agree with you 100%. It's a starting point for discussion. It certainly doesn't end it. Thank you. Um, Saab Johal, Joint Center for Disaster Research in Wellington. Um, I just want to draw attention and, and explore with the panel um, if you could respond to the asymmetry that we're um, subject to here. Um, we are bound by professional ethics, uh, responsibility, code of conduct, all, all sorts of different things. There are vested interests who are not bound by those codes of conduct who perhaps uh, populate sh social media, do all sorts of different things to cut down, to denigrate, to uh, destabilize confidence in science, public health announcements, all kinds of things. So I think I wonder whether we need to be smarter about how we organize ourselves to um, promote and to increase that trust and that sense of integrity uh, and how it is that we can perhaps even combat some of that activity. Uh, so part answer to the question I think is that uh, we have to work much harder as we were discussing yesterday and was mentioned again this morning to lift the um, uh, understanding of the importance of the issues, not just when there's a crisis and a peak, but the threshold level has got to be lifted substantially. And, um, and when it is, it's harder for people to ignore. And I think that when we just live in a series of peaks and troughs, uh, with many peaks but also many troughs, then I don't think that that works to our advantage. I think, on the other hand, um, what is leadership? Leadership actually in many respects, is being out there 
and being courageous enough to stay out there. And I think that one of the issues that we have to also grapple with is the natural human understanding to duck when somebody throws something at you. And, uh, but if you want to lead, if you want to actually um, get yourself or your discipline or your science into a position where people do take notice, then it does need leadership and it needs courage because people will throw things at you. And you can't always duck. You've got to be up there standing, defending, uh, defending the science, defending the methods of science, defending the philosophies of science, the histories of science, whatever it is. You've got to stand up and be counted sometimes. And it's important that more of us do. I, I would also add to that by just saying that um, I know Fiona Fox is sitting up here, but I think the Science Media Centre and the, w the, the, the direction it's taking is a very uh, powerful mechanism for making sure that scientists get their voice heard in a, uh, a constructive but also a challenging way that challenges some of the, um, uh, the, the dogmas that come out from various different parts of the community, of the wider community. Um, yes, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, my name is Paula Babalola. I'm one of the scholars invited to this uh, um, conference. My question is concerning how can we reconcile science and local people's culture, religions, and values. Because there's a difference between coming up with scientific figures and another thing is people's belief, people's culture, and what people consider as their value. I quickly give an example. I'm into um, indigenous knowledge practices and community forestry, and the issue of deforestation of which there are a number of policies going on concerning deforestation, against deforestation, afforestation, and all that. And asking people to reduce the use of biomass, like firewood and charcoal and stuff like that. And there are policies around this. And I did a kind of survey. I had some locals in West Africa, even up to South Africa. Why are people really using firewood? Are scientists asking why people are using firewood beyond just the normal deforestation. And a woman told me that my husband could only eat food prepared with firewood and not electricity or gas. <coughs> How can you convince such a woman to cook with electricity? Even right now in South Africa, a recent study that we conducted discovered that even despite the fact that electricity had been installed in rural areas, people still use firewood. How can we reconcile the place of science and people's culture, people's religion, people's value? Even look at what is happening concerning religion and science recently. I know the Hara Spring and the issue of terrorism and all this. Some people believe in their own religion, apart from what science is saying. So how can we reconcile this science, religion, and all these cultural values all over the world? Does anybody, would anybody want to tackle that one? No. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to respond by saying I don't think the issues of indigenous knowledge and belief are the preserve of, let's say, the developing world. I think that is alive and well within the developed world as well. And I think we have a common problem there. Um, getting science understood, it's, I mean, a lot of the discussion this morning has been about communication, mainly at the international level, but that's actually got to happen at the individual level as well. But in many cases, that communication is with the next generation. Uh, changing the current generation, changing their ways of working is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. And it's a multi-generational process, and it's about patience, um, and it's about perseverance. Um, and I think with that, I'm getting a timeout sign from our, our mega chairman here.